I'm Chris Farrell from the All Things Good and Nerdy podcast, a wacky weekend morning show, part of the Gunna Geek Network, just like the show you're checking out right now. Shows on the network are individually owned and the opinions expressed may not reflect others. Find other awesome geeky shows over at GunnaGeekNetwork.com. Talk hard and enjoy the mindgasm. The intellectual podcast starts now. Hello, hello. We are here at the Intellectual Podcast, and today we are meeting with casting director Cheryl Roberts. How are you doing today, Cheryl? I am knee deep in snow, but other than that, I'm doing just fine. How about you, sweetie? Doing all right. Not snowed in, so doing pretty good. Yeah, any day that I don't experience snow is a good day for me. <laughs> <laughs> I feel the same way. When I first got to Santa Fe, the first show that I was working on in plain sight was by accident anyway. And then when winter came, I said, boy, this is really cold. What happened out here? Why is this so cold? I'm in the <laughs> desert. So I'm thinking Palm Springs is the desert. And they all look right. at me and say, no, different desert. And I said, obviously. And then the weather dropped and the temperature went down to 30. And I said, can someone find me a fur coat or a cup of boots or I'm going to die? So, <laughs> oh, my goodness. Yeah, that high desert's a real surprise. <laughs> yeah. Very much. So now you... You've been out in New Mexico a while now, but you didn't start out in New Mexico, right? Oh, no, no. Los Angeles for 30 something years. Los Angeles for 30 something years, but then you, you hail from New York, correct? York originally, yep. I okay. do. You can tell by so, the way I talk. <laughs> you, you do have a little bit of that New York accent, just a little. I know. But, um, when you said talk. <laughs> <laughs> And coffee and everything else and my attitude i think <laughs> so cheryl how did you end up uh from one coast to the other well let's let's start back in new york so how'd you get involved in the business and how'd you get from there to here to there well i i worked a little bit in new york not as much because honestly it's kind of a sad reason i came to california i went to california because my parents died young oh and there was no real family. There was really nowhere for me to go. So I had gotten a scholarship to UCLA. It was a tennis scholarship of all things. And I uh, worked really hard to get it. Well, I was 17, I lost them. So I came to California. I was lucky enough to be able to get passage and come to you know, LA. <clears throat> and the interesting part about it was because I'm a summer baby, you know, typical Leo, whatever that means to everybody out there, Ooh, she's a Leo, look out. I don't know what that means, okay? But people say it. I don't know, it makes me laugh. But anyway, so um, here I was in Los Angeles. I didn't really know people very well. And because I wasn't 18 in those days, you couldn't live in a dorm until you were 18. It may still be that way, but it was like the law. You couldn't. Mm -hmm. So I spent um, part of the summer <laughs> on the, the wooden center floor, in the gym floor, in the cafeteria floor, the library floor, so whatever jobs I could get at school kept me there later. And then those days they didn't check. There was no big computer system because I'm no spring chicken. But I mean, there was no um, no system to figure out where I was. I said, where are you living? Oh, my aunt. So one of the students that I was his cousin. <laughs> and I wasn't his cousin. And of course, he was, of all things, an actor, of course. So people <laughs> were convinced <laughs> that we were telling the truth. So funny, I end up in casting when I can tell people are BSing me in five seconds, right? But I mean, in those days, no, they couldn't tell from me. And I went, hey, I'm pretty good at this. I could kind of con them. I like it. So nobody knew. And then when I was 18, I moved into the dorm. So what I used to do after school, and almost nobody had cars then, except some of the spoiled kids from Beverly Hills. They had cars. But the rest of us didn't really have cars, the poor kids on scholarship, you know? So I walked, which now to walk the distance from there to 20th Century Fox, seems to me unfathomable. <laughs> I don't know how I ever did it. I can't walk from the house to the car without saying, okay, I'm really tired, son. I don't think I want to go to the gym. I'm tired now, okay? But I mean, it, <laughs> but it was, I did it. We either took the bus, if we had money, we got a bus pass, or I walked. And I had a friend that went with me, and he was working at Fox part-time at the gate. <clears throat> well, I was, you know, I don't have my old pictures to show you now, but I was like kind of the one bombshell thing. And uh, it was really easy to get on, you know, to get on the set. It wasn't hard. <laughs> so I went in, they let me in the gate. I flirted with the guys. Embarrassingly, I flirted with the guys. <laughs> Unabashedly, what a bad girl, but I did. So 
I would get on the lot and I would wander around and nobody ever asked me, what are you doing? Where are you going? They'd say, as soon as I was an actress, I was part of something, whatever. And I dressed well, I knew, but I would just walk around. And finally, I walked onto a set of a particular television show and I just started talking to them. I go, how do you get a job here? How does this work? What do you do? Oh, well, they were looking for a page. I didn't really know what a page was. I assumed it was, oh, so you're probably just handing out scripts or pages, which is I took it very literally. And I sent that out kind of directs people to the chairs, you know, whatever. That's how it was. So I started doing that a little bit. It was, it was better money than I had expected. I said, wow, that's better than my, you know, $1.90 an hour for whatever the heck we were doing. And um, that was kind of the beginning. And I literally started paying attention. So I thanked my father for telling me I should have an education because it made me think. And I used my head, you know, and listened yeah. and paid attention. And that was the beginning. Well, once I did that, I had a couple, I was very lucky to meet a couple people, including people like Cal Burnett, and said, you know, well, maybe you should try to see if you can get an agent, you try to do this, whatever. Again, I got very lucky. I worked with the guys from what was called Off the Wall Comedy Group. And Off the Wall, of course, was very famous. Robin Williams came out of there and a lot of people. So D. Marcus, who had passed away, he had said to me, A, what you look like should be enough right there. And Strasburg told me the same thing. I was studying with him at the time, him personally. And boy, did he yell at me for all kinds of stuff, like how big a mouth I had, and I never shut up. I could not take direction. It took me a year to settle down and realize who I was dealing with. So anyway, um, I did get an agent, albeit not the greatest agent in the world. But she did send me through a couple things, and that was kind of fun. So I did the acting thing for not as long as I would have liked to. I met my son's father, young, and I needed a hero. It's the truth. I needed a hero. I needed somebody in my life. I didn't have family. I had nobody, no other family. And um, I married this guy. <laughs> I got pregnant maybe four months later, had my son. And I said, okay, the acting thing, I'll try to do a little bit here and there. And I had my very last audition when I was seven and a half months pregnant. Chris was like, no, I can handle this. I'll have the baby. I'll be right back. Not a big deal. I'm already doing a modeling job for Palm Springs Life Magazine. We're good. I had a little tiny pot belly. You couldn't really tell. Well, that didn't happen. Because after I had my son, I realized the person I was married to who insisted on me having a child, which I wasn't hip to. I was going to have an acting career and a singing career because I do both. He decided that after I had the child, he didn't want to split attention between a child and me. So now I'm the mother of the world, and this guy didn't want whatever. So I said, this is going to be whatever. Who am I going to turn to? I don't have anybody to help me. Okay, I got to be tough. I got to be strong. So what I did was I contacted the people that I met from MGM Studios. And I said, okay, I can't type. <laughs> I'm really smart. I'm a great speller. I'm great at literature. I can do a whole bunch of things. I do have a degree in education because I did get my degree. So I do have a degree in education, special education, which is my love. I love working with um, SPED, they call it. Um, anybody who has any kind of a, a problem is whatever. I love it. They used to call it abnormality. I don't look at it as abnormality. I look at it as something else. So it's not abnormal to me. It's normal. It is what it is. And you work with, you know, the parameters of what you have, what you're given. So I like to do that. That's where my heart is, really. So anyway, I, I did that for a while. And then I said, okay, let me see what I can do. I'm a single mom now. It's really tough. She's very young. So what can I do that's going to make a really good living? So I contacted, you know, one of the old bosses that I had known. His name was Arthur Stanich. He was the, uh, the executive vice president of distribution for MGM UA. And MGM UA was in its, well, not UA quite yet. MGM was in its heyday. Mm -hmm. And um, that's how I got involved with Rocky and all that. So that's, that's, I'll tell you how I got into casting. I'm kind of taking a little segue so you have a little background. So anyway, so I called Arthur because that's the kind of ballsy girl I am. And I called him and I said, hey, listen, I really need a job. As I said, I don't know how to type. <laughs> Um, I could probably sell anything. He goes, oh, I get that. That's not a problem. I said, I understand distribution is like, you know, you want film grosses. You're selling the film to all the big movie houses. I already know somebody from Lowe's. I already know somebody from Man. 
theaters. I know some of these people. I've met them throughout, you know, what I've been doing. And I think maybe I could give this a shot and let's see what happens. And he said, why don't you come in? Let's come in. We'll have a formal interview. So I did. So I walked past all the secretarials in the secretarial pool. They all gave me dirty looks like, who's the kid? What's up with this chick with the long blonde hair and the legs and the whole deal? And I was, I, how are you, lady? So nice to meet you all. Is that to me? I just wasn't going to be nasty back. Not till later. I was nasty a couple times till later. <laughs> but I kind of flew over the heads of everybody because as soon as I walked in, he was with Eileen Mizell, who at that time was the vice president of the whole company. And she was great. The first kid I met with that kind of power that was wonderful and taught me a lot, a lot about what I need to, to, to know. And uh, I went in and she's sitting there. She goes, who's this? What's this about? So I, I looked at him and he was like this. Nods his head. Sorry, you couldn't see me. Nods his head. <laughs> yep, I see me. I'm nodding my head, everyone else. So, <laughs> he told me. So he said, I should know that about camera, really? What do I do for a living? How silly. So <laughs> he told me, nodded his head to me. He said, you can answer her, you know, like I could tell what that meant. I was hip to that. And I said, well, I'm actually here to talk about the job of the executive assistant. I said, I really do think that I can do this. And I didn't know who she was. And they told me who she was. So I tried to be an actress and hide my abject fear <laughs> <laughs> of being this extremely powerful woman. And she kept yeah. staring at me. And I was, oh, my God, help me, please. Because I can talk my way out of almost anything, but this is going to be good. So luckily, Arthur took the lead. I was going to say, especially during that period, meeting somebody who, you know, there weren't a lot of executive women. So you knew she was a badass. Like, that would be oh, very intimidating. Sure. So Extremely intimidating. What I love about your story, Cheryl, is you're, like, not afraid to ask for anything. You're like, you know what? Why the hell not? You just go and you do it. And it usually turns out well for you, which I think is all actors should learn that. Just ask. Because okay, the worst they're going to... That's the thing. Sorry. I know you're oh, no. that. No, not at all. <laughs> yeah. It, and that's what I try to, when I teach actors, that's what I try to do. Sitting on both sides and also sitting on the marketing distribution side. I know what it is. I understand what it is. I can't believe someone's calling me now. Oh, okay. <laughs> at least they care, right? At least friends Right. <laughs> but the thing is, I try to, I do try to show this. And a lot of times it worked out well for me. I have to say it was never easy because nothing was ever given to me. I right. feel like I had to fight for everything I had. And I had to learn how to pull back a little bit because I might have fought a little too hard because I was on my own, you know? And then when I was on my own again, in all seriousness, with my son, that was tough. I had to find a place to live. I had to figure, what am I going to do with him? Who's going to sit for him? Will I do this? Whatever. So I did get hired, by the way. I did get hired. You had the job. intensity of real life driving you, which. Yes, I did. I a did. lot of people and are lacking that because they've got too much safety net. That's right. And I had none, David, and you're exactly right. So yeah. when you are pushed against the wall, you go two ways, they tell me. You either <laughs> kill yourself or you push your head to push your head to, to do something. And yeah. I think if I had had my son, I could have been that person who could have jumped off a building or been an alcoholic or drunk, God knows what. I ended up doing none of those things. I don't drink, I don't do drugs, I don't do anything. I'm so squeaky clean, it's kind of stupid. So, but <laughs> I thought of him. He was my whole everything. Not that I suffocated the kid, I didn't. But I wanted to make sure he was safe. I wanted to make sure he had everything he needed. I wanted to make sure he got what I missed out on because, you know, the situation with his dad, the whole deal. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to make sure that everything was covered. The bases were covered. So I worked really hard to do that and find people I trusted. I found a friend from the little nursery school. I trusted her with my child and thank God I made the right choice. She was great because I had to go from the Santa Ana Valley to Culver City every day. Now, if you think the traffic, the traffic bad then, now it's just ridiculous. But it took yeah. me an hour and a half, much each way. And God forbid you hit traffic on the 101 again, that nightmare. You were on Sepulveda. But they were doing construction. So you never knew. So I got home. He was usually asleep. And that was it. But I made a very good living. 
And then your question was, how, how would I end up in casting? An accident, again, a lucky, beautiful accident. Probably the best casting director on the planet that I ever met, the nicest person and the most professional ever was Lynn Stallmaster. Anyone who's an actor and any acting coach who's worth their weight knows exactly who Lynn Stallmaster is. What? He passed away not that long ago, and his wife is Lee Stallmaster. They did tons of things for UA, Rocky, I mean, you name it. These were incredible people. Well, I was walking across a lot one day. I used to like to walk. It's good for your legs. And I could flirt with the guys a lot more. All the construction crew guys, they were great. I was like, how are you today? Hi, Thoroughbred. They call me Thoroughbred because I had my dancers with. But anyway, and I wore high heels. If I did it now, I'd break my ankles and I'd probably be in a hospital bed. But that's the way it was. <laughs> For sure. And I wouldn't be flirting with the 20 year old guy. I was too busy following Cary Grant around. I saw him and I said, Oh, <laughs> all the kids from fame. And I said, Yeah, get off my tram. And they just were like, I wasn't even there. They all converged on the tram. And I said, If you want to talk to him, say, Excuse me, I'll move. And then you guys can have your conversation, all the dancers. And I was like, I was a dancer too. I said, Get off me and I'll go on the other side and you sit there. And by the way, this is my tram, not yours. It was hilarious. So I'm on my way to go see Lindsay Wagner doing her show called Jesse. Remember the other day? I couldn't remember the name of the show. It was called Jesse. Yeah. Jesse. Come in, right. It's where she played the, the criminal psychologist, whatever that character was. That Absolutely. Was so I have to look it up. I'm unfamiliar, but. Right. And um, it was at MGM, of course, on the lot. So, and Lid was doing that show. So. I'm, I went over there because my boss wanted me to drop off some kind of a folder for him. And my boss was the head of distribution. He's the cat. So when he says, you know, you go tell them this is what I want, they're going to do it because their show is going to be distributed by him. <laughs> you know, and the Lorimar people were on the second floor where we were. He goes, and why, while you're there, go drop this off to Jeff Franklin over at whatever, family full house. Okay, fine. I'm all over the place. Okay, good. I said, maybe today I'll just take the tram. No, I'll walk. So I get over there. And I walk in and I see he's got all these pictures on the floor, all kinds of pictures of actors on the floor, headshots. And I said, some family shots, children, everybody. And I looked at it and I said, that's really cool. And he says, what took you so long to get here? He said, I called the pool a long time ago. I don't know what pool he's talking about at this moment. I don't know. <laughs> so it's a comedy. It really is. I mean, someone wants to write a book about all these things that happened to me. One of my best friends who knows me since, you know, these codes and knows a lot of the things that happen and I said I don't want to some of them are embarrassing some are painful I don't really they are they are but some of the funny stuff is cool so anyway I looked at it I said so you got to match these up I guess I said this looks this person looks like she could be a mom for those two and he turns around and looks at me he said pretty good eye he said that's what I had in mind with those two and he put them together in a pile and then he said so you know, what, what time did the pool tell you to be here? I said, I said, I'm sorry. I said, let me let me tell you who I am first. So I said, I came from Arthur Spanish's office, and all of a sudden he changed completely. So he was almost nasty at me at first. Like, why are you, who are you to walk in here? You're bugging me. You're probably just a secretary. You're the, you're the person that I asked for a casting assistant, you know, which is what it ended up it was. <laughs> so, so I told him, I said, I am Arthur Spanish's executive assistant. He's like, oh, oh, I'm sorry. Okay, did he have older for me. I said, yes, sir, that's, that's for you. And he says, well, um, I'm, I'm casting right now for the show. I said, no, I know. I know Lindsay. I said, I was talking to her the other day. I said, we're talking about doing something with her for a film. <laughs> and he realized I, I may look like, you know, I should have played the hooker in the scene, but I had a brain. So he started talking to me and I, I started talking to him. And again, I was ignorant enough not to know just how big he really was. You know, right. I found out later from Roger Mayer who said you didn't know who you were talking to, the last of the mayors who ran MGM, he said to me, you didn't know who you are talking to? I said, no, I'm an idiot. Like, excuse, my, <laughs> excuse my language. I said I was a, can I curse? Yeah, yeah, yeah you yeah. can curse. <laughs> so I looked at it, I go, I'm a fucking idiot, okay? You happy now? All right? He goes, yeah, you're a fucking idiot if you don't know who that was. I said, well, I don't. So I learned right then and there to do my homework. That's for sure, which is why I tell you and tell actors, you research every single person who's on there. I want to know who the casting directors, who the directors, who the producer is, who they're affiliated with, what have they done before. Then check the things they've done and make sure those are really legit. Who worked on those? 
who's associated to whom. That's how this business rolls. You better right. know. So, it's so anyway. great. You're the second person this week who has told us that on this show. So actors, oh, really? listen up. Yeah, yeah, you're the second yeah. person. So there, there's a theme happening here. Actors, okay. listen up. Do all the research. Have to, because whoever that was, they're right, and I like them already. Um, so he told me, he said, you, you know, you kind of have a little bit of an eye. So I always have. I said, I've had something like that where I could look at somebody and say, I bet you that's the family. I bet you that's that. He said, it's an instinct. I said, about people, I have an instinct for sure. I do. He said, I would guess so, and you wouldn't get the job you got. He said, because I know a bunch of secretaries who are very upset with me. <laughs> <laughs> so do I. Believe me, they're giving me the cold shoulder. <laughs> One person on my side, her name was Marie Deer. If you ever look up Marie Deer, she was the secretary to Louis B. Mayer. She was 75 when I knew her. Blue little pistol with bright red hair. Holy cow, is she something else. I would mess with her. She knew where everybody was buried. She must have been four ten. She liked you or she hated you. That was it. Oh, I think Some you described people. every tiny ginger ever in that description. <laughs> I'll tell you, if she weighed ninety pounds, she was you could tell when she was young, she must have been stunningly gorgeous. She was still great looking at seventy five. But boy, she sat at that friend desk with Roger Mayer and she told him what to do. I kid you not. Chris worked for Louis B. She knew everything. Well, she knew all the actors, all the actors, everybody. And then I'll get back to the casting thing. I tend to segue so you can edit any way you want. She, oh, go right um, she, liked me. she liked me for some reason. And she said, you're funny. She says, you know who you remind me of? And she says, Carol Lombard. She said, I loved her. And I said, really? I said, I think that's a huge compliment. She said, it's not the look. She said, I mean, they could make you look like her. You know, you're already blonde and you're curvy and you're this and that. She said, but your personality. She said, you're very real. And I said, I've been told. <laughs> <laughs> too real sometimes. I said, I am. There's nothing phony about me. You don't want the truth, don't ask me, and I'll probably give it to you anyway. So <laughs> she, uh, she became friends. And she said, you should go back over there again if you like that part of casting. So I asked. I said, can I come back? And he said, did someone suggest it to you? And I said, Marie. And again, he straightened up like everyone was afraid of this woman. And like I said, she's like 4'10". So I told her, I said, he said, I can come back. So I told my boss, in a very flirting, bad girl way. He says, Arthur, can I please go tomorrow for two hours over to where, you know, he is? <laughs> I used it. I did. I admit it. I'm going to hell. Okay. So he told me I could. So I went over there and I basically showed him what I could do. And he said, okay, get on the phone and call this person's agent. Let me see how you handle it. Well, I handled it like I was supposed to handle it. I was very professional. I was very insistent. And when she tried to trick me into what's the pay going to be, and I didn't know, I said, I said, hang on a second. Let me go through my sheet. I don't have that in front of me. Let me put you on hold. And I look at him and go, what am I supposed to do now? And he just, like, let me stew. <laughs> he doesn't let me stew. <laughs> but then Lee came in, his wife, who was very gentle and sweet, and she was the one to helping MGM convincing them to purchase UA, which was the most brilliant thing they ever did, because what did they get? The Rocky franchise. Right. I was one of the first people sitting there watching this thing. And I went, I think this is good. I really like it. You know, I like this a lot. <laughs> so she told him, she goes, will you please not be so mean to her? <laughs> that kind of thing. Can you be, be nice to her? She's a kid, you know? That kind of thing. And I was just, oh, my God. You know, he's going to hate me because she likes me. And I'm in the middle. And what do I do? It didn't happen. He loosened up. And I realized what a wonderful guy he was. And when he found out I was a tennis player, that was it. Now we were buzzed because he played tennis. He actually had a place in Santa Fe. He got to Santa Fe before I did. I got here when he was on his way back after Lee died to go live with his grandkids in Brentwood. And that's where he passed away. But it was, if his daughter's still around, I have to say he was, the, and she, the most magnificent people and the best casting people with the best training, anybody. And I wasn't the only one. They, there was a whole lot of people in casting that came from their school or whatever, you know, because I was just an assistant. And they taught me the right way to do things. I saw it by example, you know. To this day, don't you ever not slate. And yet I see casting people that don't have anybody slate. You know what happens then? They go to submit it to a casting person and they look at it and they say, this is great, who is this person? Right. And then they have to go through what they have to go to track them down. So you tell me why in certain places, like where I am, 
they don't seem to think it's important it's really an act of his job. <laughs> Well, you and I have you and I have talked about when I worked in a casting office. One of the things, and I was just an assistant, but it drove me crazy that people didn't put their names on every piece of the material because sometimes, sometimes staples come out. Sometimes yeah. they're paper clipped, and the paper clips comes apart. And then you're like, "This is a great headshot. Who the hell is this person or this <laughs> resume?" I don't. Yeah. So put your name on everything, actors. Everything. Put your name on the slate. Put your name on the headshot. Name on the resume. Any little piece of material. Name, address, phone number, all, well, whatever. You have to, you have to, it's not mind readers. We're not mind right. readers. And I told people the first thing, I said, they said, well, I went to a casting session out here and they asked, they asked me to slay you and I'm teaching them to slay. I said, okay, well, unless you can make that person understand, and I've said it before, just have them slay. It's not a big deal. Take five seconds of your time, okay? Why not be safe and sorry? And if you, you know Meow Wolf, and of course Meow Wolf is famous all over the place, they hired me to do a course called the business of the business entertainment 101 and could have gone to probably i don't know how many people here whatever but came to me and i did it and needless to say sold out in no time and the business of the business i'm teaching everybody to do everything especially actors from a to z because the actors i work with get work period that's it or i'm not here I'm clearly not doing it for the money. It's not like we make much. But the goal is, if I'm going to do this and I'm going to be here, I'm going to do whatever I can. Because I, I, I do in person, you know, COVID, whatever, to make sure that an actor does that. And the reason you do one-on-one -on -one is classes are fine. They're good. But you get a lot of teachers who they film you and they say, okay, so what do you see? What could you do differently? What could you do whatever? You don't know what you're doing yet. It doesn't matter. You don't know what to look for. You know, yeah. look in the mirror, boy, you can't lie. So when you work one-on-one -on -one with an actor, you get to perfect every little thing and every nuance gets touched upon so that when they are ready to be with another actor, they know exactly what to do. Because you could be with another actor in a scene who has some kind of ego thing that wants to show you up, sad to say, but it happens. So I make my actors so strong that nobody would dare. They get the vibe right away and nobody's going to overtake anything. It's going to be even the way it should be. Well, and insisting on that type of training, I would imagine that it raises the bar across across the market for, for that industry. So that's important. It's huge, you know? And it's not just actors I work with. I work with politicians who shall remain nameless temporarily. Notice I said temporarily. Um, politicians, lawyers, all the time. There's a whole program that was in LA that's also in New Mexico where the, the lawyers, they do pre-trial. They do pre-trial practice where they are, it's called wadir. They're wadiring for a jury. So they have to be convincing. They have to be able to read the jurors quickly because they choose them. Both sides, defense and prosecutor, gets to do this, right? So if you know what the wadiring process is. So they hire me to, A, work with the lawyers, but also to work with the people who are watching the lawyers because to read the body language, to understand what's happening, to make sure they word something correctly to get the response they want. Because mm -hmm. let's face it, lawyers are actors. The best actor wins the case. Yep. That's all there is to it. You have to know your information, but you have to deliver it better than the other guy. The meek lawyer who's really nice isn't getting anywhere. So they hire, they hire me. It's amazing. So I've worked with a lot of them and a lot of politicians on their speeches too. Because acting goes over to a lot of different areas, you know? I was the one who supplied the actors to UNM Medical School and the law school to play patients and to play, you know, clients. So I worked with them, and then I spotted what some of the lawyers were doing. I said, that's the wrong question. You know, this, this actor is going to fool you in two seconds, yeah. and then you're going to use them as a juror, and they're not going to vote in your favor at all. Hmm. So you have to. So that becomes an instinctive thing that I try to, and I can. Instinct, they say, can't be taught, but you can teach a little bit of that in acting, and you can teach someone to be a little more sensitive to cues, mm -hmm. and I yeah. do that. But if you do it in a class, it doesn't work. And I had classes. I had Strasburg. I had Shelly Winters one-on-one, -on -one, which was probably the best teacher I've ever had in my life. She was genuinely amazing and a beautiful person. She was unbelievable. So... That to me was even better 
and I'm sorry, Susan Strasberg, you're listening, but um, your dad was great. I love you and everything. I said, but um, Shelly had a way of bringing out really who you are and making the character so real because acting, as I said, acting is true. Right. Even though you're playing another character, it's still true. If you don't bring truth to yourself, yeah, so acting is your soul. You're bearing your soul, people. You're letting yeah. the audience make fun of you, hate you, love you, want to kill you. You're doing that. And you can't do it if you can't bring it into your soul. So acting yeah. to me is bringing the outside in and then taking the outside and pushing it back out. Yeah. I've tried to explain. I've tried to explain to people that you know, because I've got friends and family members who you know talk about actors. Well, all they do is lie all day. I go, no, actors don't lie all day. Actors portray truth always, and right. the only way that an acting uh, exercise works is if that actor comes at it from a place of truth for themselves, right. and the words they're right. saying and the action they're doing might not be you know who they are or what you know but the emotion they're conveying is true it, it comes from a place of, of of truth and if it doesn't that's bad acting <laughs> that's when you call them out on bad acting because they're faking it and well yeah you have to be able to take a, a facet of yourself you know and if you were put in these circumstances this is how myself would act yeah uh, so otherwise yeah you're no, just you making it up and making it up and the thing is, it's like when I tell people I had an exercise where I had actors who never had a child portray a person who lost a child. And some of them said, well, where do I, where do I look for that? What do I do? I said, okay. I said, well, I don't know, read a newspaper article if you have to. Um, watch a television show where you saw it happen. Think about somebody it actually happened to. You know, all of that. I said, but you have to make it your own. Yeah. Yeah, you have to find your own personal truth. It's not that truth necessarily, but it's a right. truth that gets you where you need to be emotionally. Right, because you have to. You have to be able to pull that in. You take it in from the outside and then you spit it right back out with you, with you in. And that's why when you say acting is truth, and when I've said that many times, people look at me, what are you talking about? All right, <laughs> okay. You can take it or not. I can't force you to, but I know that's what works. And I know if you want to be successful, it will. Some of the actors who do method, they get almost too far and then they can't get out. <laughs> it's like, okay, I need a 10 minute post more than that's great. When we were doing Crash, it was a ride because Dennis Hopper, you know, I, I took the job. I knew he was going to pass away. You know, I said, okay, one season I'm gone. Then they found Eric Roberts, which was great. But like I said to him, I said, are you actually going to keep spinning around like a top and we have to hold up the lines for you again or what? You know? He said, I can't remember it anymore and I can't find the truth. Mm -hmm. Okay. You know, that's the end of that's the end of the time. Well, not well. But yeah. still it was a form like a champ. Brilliant. I miss him like crazy. You know, I knew him for years in LA. But these guys were great. You know, when I was a little kid and they were doing easy rider. I got to see all those guys, you know, kind of snuck around where I wasn't supposed to be. I, I, I pretty much have a habit of still doing things like that. So, but <laughs> you watch actors like that, you know, it's, it's incredible because they can find it. It may yeah. be difficult beyond the end, but they find it. And it has to come from, you know, it has to come from truth. Like I said, you don't have to totally believe it because this person never really lost a child. But you have to be able to empathize to what it would feel like if you did. And somehow I feel if you're an emotional person and you, if you're an actor, you should be able to bring that up. So the hardest people that I trained were military and police. They were taught to suppress. Be straight. That's right. Suppress it. Don't do it. So I would get in the guy's face like I was a Marine sergeant. I'd say, are you going to get to me? I'm going to get it. And I mean, I would do this. And a guy would look at me and go, this little five foot three blonde for rice, and crack up. And that's exactly <laughs> what I wanted. And then the class would crack up. I said, okay, Lieutenant, that was cool. All right, so that's the beginning right there. He says, what? I didn't learn anything. I said, oh, you did. You're going to see later, you did. So I worked him up to, <laughs> I worked him up to being, allowing the emotion to come out. He goes, okay, well, I hope it doesn't hurt me in the field. I said, it won't. 
I said, your personal you and your acting you are two different people. I said, if I believed my acting person was the same, then I would be an alcoholic, <laughs> a prostitute, a mom of six kids, a judge, a doctor. I believe every commercial I've ever done. I said, but you don't. But you believe in your work. You yeah. make it true. Yeah. Believe in your work. So he was okay down the line. I actually got him a part on the television show. My friend Peter, Peter Cook, was the casting director for a reality show where it was all reenactment. Mm -hmm. So they came to Albuquerque. It was the case of Girly Chu. It was a really sweet girl. She was the, um, the general manager of the Bank of Albuquerque who was murdered by her oh, yeah. ex wife wife. Oh, yeah. It's all reality about that. I forgot what the name was called. Murder Most. Seven Frat, Homicide, you know, one of those shows that they all have those names, or Murder Most Deadly. So I told Peter, I said, I have somebody now who can play Girly Chu. And I found this girl who was Asian, because Girly was Asian. And the interesting part about it was she had a Russian accent. <laughs> wow. So she came in. I did not know this. I picked her from a picture. This is what happens to a headshot. See what I mean? So she... <laughs> She came in and I heard the accent. That's a great accent. That's terrific. I said, so can you read the lines for me? And when she read the lines, she was still in the Russian accent. So I said, so uh, I know you look absolutely Asian too. How did you, whatever. Oh, well, I was raised outside of Moscow and she went on and on. And I was just, it only would happen to me. Very <laughs> things like this. Probably not. So I called Peter and he says, well, it's, it's like three days to get her to lose it. Holy cow. So now I'm a linguistic coach on top of a acting coach and a casting director and a producer director. How many more things can I really give me a few more hats? <laughs> so somehow she was talented enough that she was able to pull it off. Because with the reenactment there were very few lines, which I didn't know at the time. But the few she said could not have a Russian accent. <laughs> so it, it worked out well. So there are ways of reaching people if you know what you're doing, who have blocks up. Right. And a lot of actors have blocks. Or I should say aspiring actors, because everybody I meet who's never had a part says they're an actor. I said, you're an aspiring actor. You're training. Let me know when you get hired. Stop running around saying you're an actor because you're not. Because some director's going to come into town that you're going to say you're an actor, and they're going to audition you, and you're not going to know Jack. He says, okay, great. Uh, drop the drop the script and reenact what you just did for me, will you? I'd like the concept of the scene. And they're like a deer in the head, like, oh, what? I've seen it. Just, okay, okay, Jethro, we're all impressed, and you know it's embarrassing. So, who's your acting coach, and how dare you? And you don't embarrass me in front of the director, you know? So, who sent you here? How did this happen? So you really hold your stuff. You have to have the charge. You have to. Does it still mean you're going to work right away? No. Look at John Hamm. It took 10 years before someone paid attention. He's great. It happens every day. It's an old story, you know? But if you don't study, and if Robert De Niro still has a coach, I tell these people, who do you think you are? And I run into people that say, oh, I don't need coaching because I just got a line in the show. Great, because you happen to look the part, they pulled you out of line, and you need someone who spoke Spanish. Don't think you're ever going to get cast again. And, of course, did he? No. So, oh, I don't need to study. Well, good. I'm glad your ego is so great that you think you're better than anybody else. Because you're not. And I say that. I actually do. Because you're not. You don't have the training. There are some natural actors, but guess what? You start acting as a natural actor, they get you a trainer. They get you somebody who works with you. Right. Because you pulled off that one thing doesn't mean you're going to pull off anything else. Well, it's so, an, inter it's an interesting you. idea, this idea that, oh, oh I, landed, I landed one role, I don't need to do any more training. If you look at all professional careers, be it right. doctors or lawyers or engineers or whatever, they're constantly recertifying, taking classes to gain new right. skills. Like, it, it's a never-ending endeavor to master the thing that you're working at. Well, and not just that, but we're evolving as human beings. So your process as an actor is going to change over the course of your life because you've changed as a human being. You're not stagnant, exactly. one would hope. That's right. And you know, when you're a younger person and you're playing different roles, 
and then you get maybe middle age, and now you have different roles, and then you're older, and you're senior, and you totally have different roles. Just because you're a great actor doesn't mean you're totally prepared to move up to whatever that is. So yeah. you go back, and that's why you study. I mean, everything yeah. is ongoing. We learn. And why would someone want to learn anyway? The beauty of learning to me, I learn every day. I learn every day. I learn from actors. I learn from everybody. I learn from the kids. I watch them and observe them. And I learn. In my show, the reason I chose a Native American show for my new show, which is pre-production right now, is because I thought there needed to be a Native American show, and I thought there needed to be one with Native American women. So the premise of the story is there's one coming out very soon that's going to be, I believe, it was NBC, I'm not sure. That's about a family. It's a family drama that's already been greenlit. So it's going to be a lot bigger than what I'm going to do. Because I don't know if it's going to be a film. I thought it was going to be a show. Um, not really like Yellowstone, but, you know, something like that where they're going to touch on a lot of subjects. Mine is about these two women. I feel like it's Cagney and Lacey, Native American Cagney and Lacey in modern times. One of them is a lawyer who came, and they come from New Mexico, so it's good to film where you are, you know. Um, they came from Pueblos in New Mexico. One of them got a scholarship to go to Stanford. She became a very sex, uh, successful, sexual, what am I thinking? Holy cow. A very successful attorney in Washington, D.C., and married, you know, a, a big heavy-duty prosecutor, you know, famous and wealthy and the whole deal. Had a child, got divorced when the child was seven, and now that she's lived the high life and, you know, in Washington, oh my God, she's in D.C., comes home to Albuquerque, New Mexico, and it's just, you know, what a shock. And her father doesn't quite understand it, who is a, a, a famous Native American actor who almost probably cast. And then the other girl, the other woman, I want to call her a girl because she acts like a girl. She's so funny. I'm pretty funny. She's funnier than me. So there you go. But anyway, she... Uh, She's an Albuquerque police officer. Now, can you imagine how apropos for the times and everything else, right? So mm -hmm. I thought this was great. So she's an Albuquerque police officer, and she, uh, you know, she still lives with the Pueblo, you know, but she's an Albuquerque police officer. Now, why isn't she a Pueblo officer, which all the other Native people ask her? And she says, because a lot of us don't live in the Pueblo. We live in town, and there's a lot of problems there, and I want to stop them before they start. So she's like, you know, the home girl, and this other one was, you know, well, I wear a thousand dollar suit, and what the hell, you know? So the two of them come together on a case. So the end of the pilot's going to be them staring at each other. It's going to be face to face. Where, oh yeah, you think you're so smart? You don't know what's going on in the street. How would you? She's in Washington, hanging out with politicians, taking her son to the Senate the Senate lunchroom where they have the Senate bean soup, you know, the famous, <laughs> the famous bean soup in Washington. So the two of them clash, of course, that's what we want. That's part of the drama. But there'll right. be funny things, funny things, things like that. So we're hoping it gets picked up right away. So we don't have to spend the money to produce it. <laughs> but um, I think I think it's a, very much for the time. And I want to hire the actors I want to hire who I think need a shot who I know are good enough and just didn't get one because the same names keep coming up. Because I'm noticing in a lot of the newer shows, they're bringing in names we haven't heard. A lot of Canadian actors. And yeah. I have to say, they're more disciplined than people in the U.S. The Canadian shows have been here a long time. I went out there years ago for the commission. I got to be around Michael Chiklis and Stephen Cannell and the really good, good, excellent producers and people like that on the New York side of things, too. So it was really interesting to learn how they are. They have the same... Um, basic the training and the seriousness of England, of London, with the right. actors. They take everything, you know, a lot more. Where well, the arts are just treated differently, culturally speaking. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. In LA, a lot of times they might let something go, let something fly. Well, the directors there don't want to let something fly, so it's very different. The uniform doesn't have the correct button; they want it to have the correct button. As we hear, well, the wardrobe, we'll make it close, but not as much. So I learned an awful lot doing that too. But the actors were all very serious, did what they were supposed to do, funny, the whole Canadian thing. And of course, my son played hockey growing up, so he was thrilled to death. Oh, good, I get to play outside on real ice. Mom, this is me. You know, so my 
My grandson's like, can we go back to Denver so we can play outside? You know, that kind of thing. Okay. My grandson does the same. My son does. But um, I figure if I'm going to be here and I, I plan on being here for a while, my grandson is here. He's my only other family besides my son now. Um, I am I'm going to make it happen where I am. And I have. I actually produced the first reality show ever in New Mexico using all New Mexico talent that was on a CW network. So I don't think Which it was show fantastic. That? Oh, it was called Pink Rhino Dirty Laundry. And you okay. can still see a couple of those if you go to uh, YouTube. But they were funny. And the reason this happened was it was quite funny to produce this thing was we was actually hired to shoot a commercial for a store across the street. And, you know, out here, especially then, you know, there wasn't that much. So if you got a commercial, to do, I'll produce it. It was great. You know, the money was good. It was fun. And it was a national chain. They were right across the street from a store called Pink Rhino, which I didn't know at the time. So as we finished and the guys are packing up their equipment, my cameraman still had one on his shoulders looking around, taking some shots of the street, you know, things like that. And all of a sudden I look up and I see this building <laughs> that has, look at something on Melrose, even weirder, really. And it was this pink building with like a purple rhinoceros painted on it and elephants on the other side. It had an angel outside mannequin with white wings and the whole thing, a bunch of clothes lined up. And we just saw people walk in there, whatever. And I said, what the hell is that? And I told Lonnie, I said, just keep rolling. Just ahead, keep rolling. So we walk across the street. We had nowhere to go. And the streets are small. It's right there. And I walk into this place. And just as I enter, a woman, long blonde hair, little tiny thing, comes flying out wearing the same costume that the angel mannequin has on. And I said, okay, it's not Halloween. <laughs> this is summertime. What's going on? This is crazy. So we walk in, and it's a resale store. But she was just this fluttery, I don't know how to describe her. But Eclectic. She was a, I guess. She was the wildest thing, and I thought she was playing nuts. And she had all these characters. And as we're standing there, I see these four people walk in that look very familiar to me, because it was right next door to the Auxiliary Dog Theater, which is a theater a lot of performers nationally come to, from New York and everywhere. So sure enough, I recognized one of them. I said, that's the New York doll. And it was. Anytime they were on the Southwest, they went to one of her stores, walked in and found clothes, shoes, and everything to wear for the drag shows. What the hell? So I said, okay, this is Twilight Zone. What's happening? Are we on candy camera? And my guy's like, no, we're the ones with the camera. I said, good. And they're on candy camera. We're good. If I can mention candy camera. <laughs> well, who knows? So we went in. I told her I, I started filming what was going on and watching everything. One of the dolls actually thought I worked there because I helped them pick out a pair of shoes. <laughs> that was funny. I said, no, actually, I'm the director and producer. Put it. So anyway, I asked her, and we already had releases, of course, from the commercial we did because they wanted people walking in the store. So I said, get the releases out right now. <laughs> I just had an idea. So I told her, I said, tell me something. I said, are you interested? And anybody ever asked me about doing a TV show? Oh, some of the people from the local network came in and they talked, but I wasn't really listening. She was flighty <laughs> and funny and silly. So I had just left the people from um, from Breaking Bad and was talking to Stephen Michael Pizzotta, who was going to do a talk show. And he did do a talk show, which was also on the CW. So now it was a matter of when they're placing what. So now I used my cloud from LA. I went to the CW in Albuquerque and I said, okay. What would it take to get this thing on the air? I said, because this is hilarious and nobody's ever seen this. And I, I want it to be a reality show. Because just in two hours, what I saw going in and out of there and the, her interaction is some of the funniest stuff I've ever seen. I mean, reality could never, you couldn't write it. You could not write it. It was not scripted. Towards the end, it had to be semi-scripted because one of the husbands came in and was just ridiculously vulgar and outrageous to his wife who worked there. And I said, besides, I want to punch him in the face and hit him on the head with a hammer. Um, I'm not allowed to say what he called her and all those things. Anyway, I said, so we're not going to do that, okay? So we had to have a little bit of skipping going on. But in the beginning, I'm telling you, it wasn't. The reason we called it Pink Rhino Dirty Laundry was because people would come in with big trash bags full of clothes and go, here you go, and dump them on the counter. I said, it's like somebody's dirty laundry. What the hell is this? Well, to make it even better, because of my husband at the time was one of the black crows. They told you Atlanta. 
So I said to Chris, I go, you know what? There's a song I really want to use because what's it for? And I said, well, I want to call the show Pink Rhino Dirty Laundry. He goes, oh, I got to call Glenn Fry. So if you listen to it, you'll hear the theme song is Dirty Laundry. Yeah. And it's a real song. Oh, wow. So that was very lucky, I got to say. But anyway, the show was successful. The show was silly. The show was fun. And I got a lot of actors' jobs that had no chance. It was nothing. It was just nothing. So I started saying, okay, let me train you for a little while. You can do this. Okay, Julie, I want you to act like you're the person coming in. Bring your dog like you're shopping. She goes, I am shopping. I said, good. But this is where you're going to look. This is what you're going to do. So I didn't have to be that much of a director. It was pretty good. And then the director I hired took over, thank God. It's producing and directing, a lot of energy. So it was, it was cute. It was fun. We did a bunch of episodes. It was great. Towards the end, um, it was just I had to go do something else, and that's when Crash started. That was also at the time my son's um, wife passed away. So we haven't had a lot of luck. So anyway, that happened, and I was going to go home. And then I didn't go home because I have a grandson. <laughs> so I helped my son, who's in the restaurant business. And um, my son was the GM of High Finance, which is the famous restaurant in Albuquerque that they, you take the tram to. It's that famous tram up there. He was a GM of that one down below. When they closed for remodeling, he opened up his own in Albuquerque. So that's pretty much what happened. And so that's how you ended up in New Mexico and are, continue to be in New Mexico. Um, we, we're almost, we actually are almost to an hour already, if you can believe that. But uh, before we wow. head out, <laughs> before we head out, um, if people do want to contact you for either as an acting coach or as a casting director, oh. What's your contact info? How do they get a hold of you? Got it. Um, I do. I do so much personal contact that you know the whole website thing is silly, but I do have one because my assistant insisted on making it. So I can tell you what the email is, but I have to look it up. So if you want to give me a second, I'll do that. Which oh, I know right. I can also edit. I am just so not techie. It's, it's really sad. It's really sad. I am so not. No worries. Oh my God, Generation speaks Gen. I can't talk. No, it's on the first step. Okay, let me see. There we go. All right. I will find it right. In the writing session, here it is. Um, okay. That's, that's not it. Before that one. Correction. Website address is. Oh. The website is actors dash. Path, All right, actors path, actors dash. Actors. It's a dash, it's a hyphen, whatever you want to call it. Actors hyphen path okay. dot com. I've got it on the so, screen now. Okay, oh, perfect. Look at that. Mark people, not me. Okay. And let me give you the phone number because I honestly do. I interview everybody, as you know, as I did with you. Mm -hmm. I, I can't take everybody. I'd love to take everybody. I can't. Um, but I have to make sure somebody's really serious because I'm going to work you hard. I'm always nice. I'm not insulting. I don't believe that. I, unfortunately, was the victim, as I say, of very insulting acting coaches. I do not believe that gets the best out of you. Nina Foch, excuse me, that bitch. Oh, my God. She hates women, she, well, hated, she's gone, hated women so much that it was horrible. And if you look like me, it was even worse. She wow. was a monster. I can honestly say I couldn't learn much because she really only wanted to work with the guy. She was terrible, miserable, miserable hag woman. Then when I met with, um, when I, I met one time, I can't remember the date. I want to say it was like 1970. Wow, I'm old. 1974, maybe five, and I met at an after dark party, and Mae West was there, and she had to be carried in. She was 88, it's her birthday party. And I told her, and she liked me. She didn't talk to women that much, but we were both Leos. And she was, no, no, I know who you are. She was, yeah, bombshell, we'll talk. So we did, I sat down, I had nothing to do. My partner was running off with Don Deloise. There was nothing, nowhere for me to go. So I sat <laughs> there, I didn't know anybody. I'm not shy, really, but I kind of was, you know, I didn't know. And all of a sudden, I'm sitting there and realize she's behind me on her big thing and talking to me. I was, holy crap. 
you know. So I told her what happened with Nita Crow. She's like, ah, she's a bitch. She's always been a bitch. You don't need her. That kind of thing. <laughs> and she's the one that said, talk to Shelly. Talk to Shelly. <laughs> Nobody else told me to talk to Shelly. So that, honest to God, my son, that came from May West, who I respected I forever. She was amazing. I mean, like, she didn't get it, really get her career started until she was 40, so she's my role model. I'm like, damn. And she was a sex symbol at that age in that time period. So I'm like, you go, lady. Wow. You go. She really did get carried in. There were all these muscle-bound dudes that carried her in. Plus, one of them, I think, was her boyfriend or whoever, because he was older. He was still in good shape, but he was a guy that was also with her. And Mickey Hargitay, Briska Hargitay's dad, you know, from uh -huh. SVU. First Jane Mansfield's husband, Mickey Hargitay was one of the guys who carried her in. Huh. So I met <laughs> Mickey a long, long time ago. Yeah, there. Very nice. You know, and that is Mariska's dad. I don't know why I didn't put it together a long time ago. The name like Hargitay, I should have known, you know. But anyway, so that was that. But um, you know, that the people want to really work, as you know, and you know personally as a good actress. And people out there, just so you know, these are two very beautiful people. They're doing this to help you. They're doing this to inform you. They don't have to, okay? As I don't have to. I don't need to be an agent and a manager, but I seem to take the role because I love my craft with such a passion that I want you all to get there. The people that I teach, and I'm just going to say, I'm not going to be humble. They work. And I have no problem picking up the phone and calling somebody and saying, you really should see this person. An agent should be doing that. They should be following us. But sometimes they don't. But I work. Right. And I do. And I can attest to that because, I mean, I've been working with you for a very short time and you were on the phone calling people for me. I'm like, oh, oh shit, she's for real. It, it took like two two days. I'm like, all right, well, that was fast. It's like go, I don't it's like go get New York attitude. I love it. Oh, yeah. yeah. I just, oh, I'm injured. I'm in a snowstorm. I'm by myself, everything else. It's not going to stop me because the motivation for me to do that is an, an actor or inspiring actor showing me they really want it. They really yeah. want it. Yeah. When someone told me that years ago, Betty Hutton said to me, how hungry are you? We didn't even know it was her. She was a recluse. She's sitting next to me in Westwood where I went to school, UCLA, on a lounge chair. Nobody knew who it was, but my mother raised me watching those movies and things. And I, I went, oh my God, that's Betty Hutton, who a lot of actors today don't know. And they should, because that woman carried a film and a, and a stage show more than anybody I've ever seen. Sing, dancing, acting, everything that they all did. She was incredible. And she transferred to screen with no issue. And that's what she said to me. Are you hungry? And I'm so dumb. I'm a kid. I'm like 18. I said, well, yeah, I really didn't eat today. I thought about a dollar left out of <laughs> And she looked at me. She, said, she just looked at me like, are you the dumbest person in the world? But she didn't say anything. Now I know what the look meant. But then she said, I actually meant, are you hungry? You really want it. I said, I don't care about the fame, but I want to do it. And I believe I can. And she said, and you sing. She heard me sing. I said, oh, yeah, I've done all kinds of stuff like that, whatever. And I did. And when I had an opportunity um, from Hal Blair to become a country singer, and a big one, because he wrote Elvis and stuff, he wrote all kinds of, if you look him up, you won't believe it, the Hall of Fame. And I was such a dummy. I said, nah, I don't want to do country music. <laughs> I had nobody to guide me. I think if I had a sister or brother, they might have said something to me. Like, right. you think you should try this? I had nobody. So things happened and they passed us by. And then I found out I could dance like my mother did. My mother was a famous ballerina in New York. I was lazy. I didn't want to work that hard, you know? I said, Mom, I don't have to do that. I can I can sing a song and get paid and you do killing yourself eight hours a day. I don't want to. So I'm sure I hurt her feelings. <laughs> Sorry, Mom. Sorry, Mom! <laughs> <laughs> well, Cheryl, you have the same Cheryl. relationship with your mother that I currently have. <laughs> Sorry, mom. That's, I know that's what you keep saying. I look up all the time, both of them. My son says, You must have been her horrible. You probably killed him. What a great thing for your child to say. I killed him. I don't think I was driving the truck. Well, okay, well, no. I know. I miss him <laughs> terribly. Never got to see anything. But I know growing up, I was a character. My parents were very quiet and very sweet, and they called me the mouth that roared. I came out like this, and nobody knows her. <laughs> but yeah, if actors are interested, if you really want to work, I'm not going to let you off the hook, people. I'm not. 
you want to work, and I see that you want to work, and you're not a jerk and say, oh, I'm going to work with this lady for four. I'll take four lessons because I know she'll call an agent for me, whatever. You think you're going to fool me casting as many years as I have? I'm going to know in two seconds if you're real or not. If you're real, I'm going to help you get there. And I have absolutely no problem. I mean, I know several agents. I know them all over the world. It's not that difficult if you want to. Well, not for me. I pick up the phone and say, hi, how are you doing? I have somebody to discuss. It's not. And we can make awesome. it happen. Once you do, you move to a different level, you know? Then, but still self-submit. Still do everything you can. You are your own entity. And I teach that when I teach the business of the Business Entertainment 101. And sometimes I have guests from L.A. When I taught it at uh, Meow Wolf, I did. I had an actor who's, oh, my God, he's done more character roles than anybody I've ever seen. And he said the same thing. What Cheryl's telling you is the truth. Listen, Greg Serrano, you know, he just went back to L.A. a couple of years ago. He's working all the time again. He was out here because this is where his wife and child were. And he worked with me. Same thing. He said, I swear to God, he off my game. So, you know, if you want it, you got to go for it. And you vote for it. Period. <laughs> yep. And quest- Persistence, <laughs> showing up, all those things are important. You know what? You know what, David? You're right. You cannot reinvent the wheel. And I tell people, you can't reinvent the wheel. The system is the same. You have other outlets, like these technological things that you do. But the system is still the same. Mm-hmm. You do what you do and make it. You've got to follow that path. Unless, of course, your name is Hanks or something. <laughs> Whatever. But I mean, most of us, it's not. So yeah. we have to step. We still have to do the hustle. Yeah. You do. Follow yeah. the steps, you're going to make it. That's all I'm going to say. Follow the steps. Make sure if you do have a coach, some other coach, whatever you do, they really know what they're doing. They're not just saying, okay, watch this and do whatever. You can read books to your blue in the face. Good for you. That's an, an adjunct, which you've got to study. Face-to-face, it's very, very important. Whether yeah. it's online or whatever, it's important. And one-on-one is the utmost important because then the coach can catch them, fix them immediately, right away, and say, watch me follow this. But you have a class of a whole bunch of other people. Everyone's in a different direction. You try to bring them all to center, but you can't. Everyone's different. And you also have female and male energy. So you have to be able to divide it up. And I discovered that working with Miss Winters, that she was right. So there you have it. All right. Well, on that, thank you so much for doing this interview with us, Cheryl. And uh, I hope that you are safe and sound in the snowstorm. Keep warm. <laughs> yeah, my poor, my poor Chris. Oh, yeah. Last thing I want to mention, too. Um, Chris is probably the top engineer in, in Santa Fe or in New Mexico. Um, he engineers all the major stuff whenever they do the voiceovers, when they filmed here, like when they did Briar Patch, mm-hmm. all the, you know, the stuff that they do. There's the big studio, and that's who gets called into engineer, and that's my engineer. And yet, hard to believe, because nothing seems to be working today, so I don't know what's going on. But he's very good. But he's also a musician on top of it. And Chris and I both, we teach classes in voice and guitar in Santa Fe and Albuquerque. Chris is only doing face-to-face as far as guitar goes, because, boy, that's a tough thing to do. But the voice works well online. So people can call me at the same number if they really want to up their game with voice. If they want to, you know what I mean? Awesome. And then thank you can, for giving that shout out. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> so I've got the contacts to help singers as much as I have for actors. That's fantastic. Cool. Thank you, Cheryl. Yeah. Thank you thank so you. much. So, so nice to finally meet David. I didn't know he was a good looking young guy. <laughs> yeah. I'm terrible. <laughs> I'm flirting with young man. Oh my god, I'm terrible. Oh my god. I'm, I'm not. Uh, I'm not. You know, I'm not against it. So it's all good. <laughs> no, you are. You're good looking, and you're an actor too. Uh, yeah, I do a little bit of acting. I want to do more. It's you know, it's one of those things. When I was younger, I didn't have the confidence to do it. And now that I'm older, and you know, I'm like fuck it. <laughs> I want to do right. it. Let's do it. No, but you're right. That's the right attitude. Take the shot. And you're not too old. Look at what the median age is.